um, all sorts of olive oils and specialty sauces and stuff like that. And we get to do really cool things like tastings and weddings. Um, and so we're just really thrilled to be able to continue doing what we do and gather today and uh, enjoy some cheese. So um, I always like to kind of do a quick run through with the wines, just in case people who did buy the wine package aren't looking to open all three bottles. And for those who didn't buy the wine package, we're not gonna only talk about wine tonight. We're mostly gonna focus on the cheese, but I'll give you some pairing suggestions and we'll just kind of talk about the cheese in this kind of general pairing um, lens or, or focal point so you can figure out what you wanna do with it at home and you know the next step for all these cheeses. So, um, and then the last thing is, as Benji mentioned, you know, we have a lot of resources beyond myself in this Zoom call. So please ask questions. Let us know how we can help, and uh, we'll make sure to pause a couple times to get some of the questions that are in the chat on air. Um, okay, without further ado, let's talk wine real quick. I have three kind of fun lighter wines. It's spring, it's warming up uh, very slowly in Michigan, but it, it's gonna happen, it always does. Um, and so we have a Vermentino. This Vermentino happens to be from France, which is this fun little twist. I like to say this is like a new world, like new age funky wine in the absolutely most traditional conventional way. Uh, French wine, just an Italian varietal. I really enjoy it though. Alessio, this is our house favorite rosé, the Gris de Gris from Domaine Fonsant. Um, so the big difference between these two wines is going to be kind of the edge or the acid. The Alessio, I get a little bit more herbaceousness, a little, definitely a higher acid. It's going to be kind of a little more electric. And then the Fonsant is a lot softer. Um, and then we have a Chianti, okay? And so for those who are at home, the, you know, the soft, the high acid, I'm gonna try to talk kind of general in case you're thinking of what you're gonna do with these and you don't have these wines in front of you. Hopefully we can kind of educate everybody at the same time. Um, and then the Reds of Chianti, um, kind of a classic wine varietal, but it really goes great with a couple of our firm cheeses in this lineup. So those are the wines. Um, Feel free to open all of them. Uh, you know, none of them as you see fit. All right. Um, anybody have any questions before we go ahead and dive in? Um, the only question so far was what wine is best with all the cheeses, white or red? So. Yeah. And so this tasting, I went through this last night and had a great time. Uh, my wife, Megan, and I actually did a, a preview tasting. And um, my rule is always that there are no rules and that it's your personal preferences. So if you really like white, you should open the white. And if you really like red, you should open up a red. They work fairly. Um, I think white is the more obvious choice, but I think red works with at least half of them really well. Um, red and goat sometimes fights. The white, the red we have is pretty good with it. Um, and if you have a little, like little softer red or something that's more, aged in bottle condition, it can be even better. So um, yeah, let's dive into it. So the very first cheese is from Idle Farms. And we've been really loving Idle Farms cheese really ever since we started. Idle Farms is coming up in Northern Michigan in uh, Northport, and they are about five years old. And in this time, they've really taken the like, competition cheese making by storm. They just keep winning awards. It's really fun to see. I think they're in many ways helping put Michigan on the map as a dairy state. Um, they have their own herd of alpine goats and it's, you know, so they're a farmstead operation. And I think it's really important to talk about how creameries, creameries are getting their milk. And in today's day and age, we talk about farmstead because most people buy milk from somebody else. Um, this term factory milk in some ways. And for many years, you would never have designated, oh, this is a farmstead operation because everybody made their cheese from the milk they, you know, from the animals they raised. Now it's the exception. And I think that why it's super important is if you put as much work as you do into raising an animal and getting the milk, you tend to not trip at the finish line making the cheese. You've put so much love into it you really make an exceptional cheese, I find. Um, they're also practicing some really cool techniques like rotational grazing up there. So they have 200 acres of land in uh, the peninsula up in Leelanau, and they're practicing a 
a method called rotational grazing that was you know kind of popularized in the United States by a farm uh, polyface uh, Joel Salison, I believe is his name, something like this. And it's this idea that the animals kind of move through their land. They keep eating the grass and as they move away, you have the next thing coming through. And so um, as their droppings fertilize the earth and then you could potentially have chickens who would eat that area and then they'll fertilize further and the grass keeps growing up and then you bring the goats back as the grass grows and you kind of keep using the, the land. And this really is the antithesis of kind of our industrial farming practices of monocultures and what it why we talk so much about grass while we're talking about cheese is because you know you are what you eat and what you eat you know same with with the milk of these goats and so if they're eating uh, a mediocre diet we're going to get a mediocre cheese but luckily uh, Amy and Melissa and their team over at Idle Farms are really feeding these goats very uh, beautiful Michigan grasses and they're happy goats. And for proof, you should check out their Instagram feed. It's one of my favorite Instagram feeds. It's a lot of pictures of happy goats running around, which is the joys of the you know, social media. Um, and so they have their idle pastures. Uh, the idle pastures we chose for this one is their fennel and garlic. The reason being is as spring changes and what we're eating, this just spoke to me. You know, it's a really beautiful cheese. I love all the idle pastures, but this one particularly, the fennel has this really like, you know, for those who people who don't like fennel or black licorice flavors, I think fennel, fennel pollen is a fun introduction if you don't know it. It has such a kind of more fragrant expression of this idea, and I don't find it to be nearly as polarizing. So you get this kind of flowery flavors, and then the garlic really brings it home for the you know green and the things that are coming up especially in michigan you know we're a kind of forage heavy um produce and so you have a lot of the, like scapes and garlic scapes and fiddleheads and ramps and i think this cheese just kind of makes me think of all these you know new things that are coming out of the earth um and i also thought for the wine it was really fascinating if you drink the two whites or the white and the rosé with this cheese you um it almost becomes a choose your own adventure. Uh, so I found that the Vermentino, which I said earlier has kind of an herbaceousness and that really sharp edge, that really brought out to me the garlic in this and made it a very like, you know, savory cheese. While the Fonsant being a little prettier played with that like fennel pollen kind of flavors, more blossomy and soft. Um, both are really great options. For those who really like red, I'd love for you to try the red. We'll talk a little bit about how I evaluate pairings later out and, and get some language that we can share to talk through pairings. But uh, I thought this was just such a good like introduction to the season as you start cooking different things and you start looking for your, you know, your peas and your, um, you know, greens and things like that. You want something that kind of mimics that. And so, um, yeah, we decided to switch it up and do this one today. Oh, so what does everybody think? Uh, people are liking a couple questions for you, Zach. Um, yeah. Is there a good farmstead cheddar cheese that's available around here? Will answered Flory's Truckle, if you want to expand upon something like that. Yeah, totally. So um, Michigan, while we are so close to Wisconsin, we have never been quite the cheddar state that like Wisconsin is. We certainly have some hard cheeses um, and some cheddars. We're more known for the pecaning and things like this, which is a very similar cheese. Um, but we'll nail it on the head for a farmstead cheddar that we have on a regular basis. Flory's is awesome. It's not quite a farmstead because it's like the Flory family is a wonderful Amish family and they're making a cheese from their own small herd. I think they only have like 20 cows and they're giving it to the Milton Creamery to finish the aging and do the distribution. So it's made in the same kind of spirit of a farmstead cheese, but you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to use that labeling. Um, yeah, so yeah, great question. Um, is the garlic raw or cooked? I know AJ answered in the chat, but for people who don't know. Ooh. Um, AJ answered in the chat, awesome, yep. cool. Um, garlic and herb is dehydrated organic herbs for those not, not checking the chat. Beautiful. Um, and I also think that, you know, just as a quick little side tip, I really love in terms of like a DIY, ways to doctor up cheese boards and do things with your own little flair taking a plain goat disc and putting it in like 
the herb covering you want is a great idea and a great way to kind of spruce things up. This one is really well dispersed throughout the cheese, so it's even more special. But if you, you know, wanted to take that herbaceousness to the next level and chop up chives and roll it across, you know, you could add that really easily. It's a great way to kind of spice things up. Um, great. Is there uh, real quick before you jump in, is there a proper way to taste the wine with the cheese? Is it wine first, cheese first? What's, yeah. what's the best way? Great question. So whenever I'm doing any of these kind of evaluations, um, my first step is to meet everything on its own, right? Go through all the cheeses, taste them. And I know the first one is a tub, but you know, this gives me a moment to talk about cutting the cheese properly. You'll see for cheeses like the Alp Blossom and the Manchego, you have a rind on two sides often. And so I want to make sure to cut towards the back rind and kind of, you know, cut what I want for the bite that I'm having. This cheese has kind of a waxy rind, so I'm going to cut that off. And then this way I'm keeping the cheese as intact as I can. So if I'm not going to go through the whole thing today, I have a nice piece in hand. So, you know, like I was saying, um, whatever cheese you're in question, you're going to taste the cheese. Then you're going to taste the wine. And then after that, you're going to actually, this is a little graphic, you're going to make a little bit of a slurry, right? I, I think that when we're giving people suggestions on what they should do at home and how to enjoy something, it's up to us to do a little bit more uh, road testing than the average consumer. And so uh, I think if you're sitting on the couch and drinking and eating and you're not really mashing them up together, everything tastes great, right? It really takes this uh, more committed effort when you're making the pairings to kind of uh, chew a little bit of cheese, take that wine, really mix, and then that's how you determine if it's like this is a good enough pairing. Um, and like I said, we'll get to in a little bit what the kind of methodology I use for evaluating those is. So, yeah. We also, this tasting, you know, beyond this kind of idea of red or white, the other thing I really played with was um, the order of a cheese tasting. So often we're very like uh, strict. We're going to start with the soft cheese and with the hard cheese. But flavor is kind of a multifaceted idea. And sometimes you have a soft cheese that's more pungent than a hard cheese and vice versa. And so I kind of purposely uh, broke that rule. So I went from the idol to the Manchego um, because I think that as we kind of progress through the night, you'll see the other cheeses have some more dominant flavor notes. Uh, so yeah, if you're ready, and Benji, does everybody seem ready? Yep, I think it's time awesome. to jump in. Let's jump into Manchego. So um, I, I give Manchego a little bit of a hard time just because I find it to be the number one most requested cheese across a cheese counter, maybe even more than Parmesan. And I think it's because of its name recognition. It has a great name. Um, it's a cheese that's existed in some form or another since the time of Don Quixote. It is mentioned in the book. It is also from La Mancha, like the man from La Mancha himself. And uh, so it's this historical storied cheese. It also, so often when I'm asking people, who's had goat milk and who's had goat cheese or sheep cheese and this, people are like, oh, I've never had a sheep cheese. And then you're like, who's had Manchego? And the whole room raises their hand. And so many people don't know it's, a, it's many people's first introduction to alternative milks. And so it's this great cheese with this great history. But what we're eating today is so shaped by like modern history at the same time. So cheese that has history back in the 1600s and doesn't actually get its name designation squared away until 1984. Um, to put that in some level of like context, Charlemagne makes a royal decree about Roquefort in the 1400s. So like that is often considered the first rule about a food, but it isn't you know, the modern history, kind of the AOC or PDO or these various, sorry, one second. Do not disturb, did not work that well. Okay, there we go. Um, so the more modern kind of movement towards name designation comes right before World War II. So really like early 30s, Champagne gets the first name designation as a modern product. And 
Obviously, there's this huge pause with World War II, but it doesn't get picked up for a really long time by the Spanish. Uh, the Spanish had a very tumultuous post-World War II. They had this Franco regime and an authoritative, authoritative dictator. And it takes until Franco's death, 78, um, or I'm sorry, 75, and then 78 is the new Spanish constitution. And then it takes, you know, a couple years of finding themselves until you have um, a kind of revitalization of national pride over your artisan food that had been happening in other countries like France and Italy for decades at this point. And so Spanish um, cheeses, because of that, are kind of, they're marred by a world of globalization and industrialization. The, the, the system's already really big and across the entire world. And so when they go to write the circle, the rule of like, Manchego has to come from this region, from this way, using this to method, um, it's a larger circle than let's say Parmigiano Reggiano or Roquefort or many of these other name designated cheeses. And so uh, a tagline that if you've been to the shop, you've probably heard me say is, not all Manchegos are created equal. While you can buy a Parmigiano Reggiano and be assured a certain level of quality, um, I find that some Manchegos are really not worth the name that it's printed with. Um, so we at Monger's Provisions have worked with really two different houses. Um, and they're the houses that I've worked with since I was at Zingerman's and at Byright. Um, they're the cheese companies I've always preferred. So El Trigal is who we have right now and it's a one-year Manchego. Um, Arti Queso is the other one. Both of those companies started out as cooperative creameries. So, you know, they were buying milk from a couple of their neighbors, pooling it and making a cheese. And then they got larger um, and kind of became a larger entity. But I think that having roots and actually making the cheese makes them a really, a much better company. Um, I saw Jordana say, what does the one year? And the name designate. Designate. So it designates how long the cheese is aged. Um, it has to have aged for at least one year to get that stamp. This company uses coloration on their paraffin wax to designate the different ages. But, uh, you know, you'll see a lot of like, so often in Manchego, you use this word Corrado, semi-Corrado, um, fully Corrado, and then uh, Añejo. So like, how old is the cheese? You'll see these, you know, three month cheeses, three to six months, you'll see six to eight months, and then a year or year plus. So we've really liked this one. Um, full disclosure, my favorite Manchego is the eight month Manchego from Arti Queso, but it's not your favorite Manchego as a customer base. We've done a lot of like side by side on the counter. And after three years of tasting it with you guys, this really seems to be the Manchego that the customers like the most. And, you know, part of the fun of being a uh, cheesemonger is I get to make my assertions of what I like the most and show you guys. But really, um, it, it has to be about what you guys all enjoy, too. So this is the Manchego we've had for a while now. So, Zach, yeah. what determines if you eat the rind or leave the rind is a question we have. Yeah, great question. So. For soft cheeses, it's, uh, it's easier. Very few soft cheeses have a rind that's inedible, right? Um, you know, the, the goat cheese, the first one had no rind. When we get to the next one, you're gonna eat that whole rind if you choose to. Um, firm cheeses, you kind of have two different styles, right? This one, you can see has this paraffin wax. It has a little bit of wax paint that they've done. Um, and it's totally food safe, it's not gonna hurt you. It's like eating the cheesy version of the, the wax lips as a kid. Um, and then on other cheeses, like the second one, the Alp Blossom, you have a more natural rind. And we'll talk about that when we get to that cheese. It's such a pretty rind. It's going to take up some of our conversation. But uh, I think that rind you should totally eat. How I determine this, if I have never met the cheese and I'm trying it for the first time, is I'm going to take my cut again, right? And so I have one rind on one side. I'm gonna take the cheese and I'm gonna actually eat towards that rind. If I like everything that's going on, I'm gonna keep eating. And if I like everything, I'd eat the rind. So even this one that's waxed, it wouldn't hurt you if you wanted to try and see what happens when you get to that drier edge. Um, when you get to a firmer wax, like a really hard Gouda, you know, I wouldn't suggest that because it'll crack a tooth. Um, but if you're talking about a cloth-bound cheddar or a Gruyere, or some of these rinds that look like they're just, actually I'm sitting in front of a, a whole case of cheese, so why don't I just show you what I mean? Um, like a rind like this one, 
where it just kind of looks like dry cheese. Um, some people eat that. Some people really like, sorry, get it in, in the cheese can. So this is a cheese called Sweetgrass Dairy out of uh, Georgia. Shout out to some of the folks who grew up in Georgia out here. Um, this is a really cool cheese and it has a natural rind, meaning that you've made a young cheese and you just put it in the cave and let time harden the cheese. And some people really love that. It has a lot of cave flavor, a lot of funk. Some people trim it off. It's really up to you. Um, but like I said, eat towards the rind and kind of as you keep going up the pace, if you keep like what's, if you continue to like what's going on, go all the way and try it. And then you know with that cheese. Uh, Zach, we have another really great question. How have cheese artisans and dairy farmers in Michigan been affected by the pandemic? I know it's something we've talked about. On yeah, way. we've talked a lot about it. Um, you know, we're a little, I guess, sneak peek, peek of one of the next classes is we're going to do a box that really focuses on some of those individual stories. It's really hard. It depends on the farmer. It really depends on the, uh, the network and avenues you've already built. Um, so, for instance, if your entire distribution relied on three or four restaurants and then you went to the farmer's market, you're in a really tough spot, right? You didn't have that relationship with the grocery store. And those relationships are really challenging, especially for small scale cheesemakers. Um, you know, to use a local chain out here, and I actually don't know their policies, so I'm not trying to besmirch them. But if you went with Plum, um, some markets like a Plum might say, cool, We'd love to bring it on. You need to have enough for all five or six markets that we have right now. That's a real big challenge for a small cheese maker who's like, I could supply one grocery store. And so um, some of the sales channels that still are on right now, they can't take advantage of. So it really depends on the relationship they have with their milk supply and how hard it's been. Um, for Idle Farms, uh, they stop making cheese, but they also control their own supply. It's their goats. Um, and I'm actually really looking forward to interviewing Amy later this weekend and Melissa, and so we can talk a little about that really tough decision for them. Um, some of the creameries we deal with in Michigan most closely is Zingerman's Creamery, um, Idle Farms, and Evergreen Lanes, and they're all three still making cheese. And um, fresh cheese ends up being the really the hardest thing. Uh, because you don't really have weeks to wait on. If you have a cheddar and it goes this month, uh, or sorry, it goes, sells three months from now and not this month, chances are it's not a big deal, but uh, a, a cheese like this four months later is a real big issue. So, yeah. Cool? Yep. Cool. All right. So, um, just back to real quick on the wine pairings with the Manchego before we move on to the next cheese. Um, I thought this is where it really starts getting obvious that what your preference is decides, right? So I really like white wine. Um, and for me, the kind of crispness, crispness of the Elysio cut through the fattiness of the Manchego. Um, but I thought the red was really cool and gave you kind of a sense of how um, meaty the Manchego is. We talk a lot about flavors like I, I think it happens more in goat cheese than anything where you hear people say, oh, it's goaty. Um, Manchego, you know, you taste the flavors of lanolin. It's, a, it's an oil found in, you know, in the wool and it's going to be in the cheese. And so it tastes lamby, it tastes meaty. And I think this wine does a really good job with the Manchego. Um, so this is really where it starts to, to span out like that. Um, all right, so the next cheese is a Rulo de Cabra. Um, and this is a cheese that I find really fascinating um, because it is such a great, like, from like a teacher standpoint, I feel like it's a lesson plan in a cheese. It gets so many different things I like to talk about all in one cheese. Um, it is a cheese that you'll see in France called Boucheron, and you'll see a very common Spanish um, cheese called, uh, oh, now I'm gonna forget what it's called. I bet Will's typing it right now, Caña de Oveja. Um, and it's very similar to Caña de Oveja, which is just a trademark term. So this is the category that Caña de Oveja would be. Um, and what you have is essentially a Spanish boucheron, which boucheron is a French goat law. And so you take cheese, this is a cheese that uh, originates in the Loire Valley in France. And you take goat milk, you put it into these like long molds, 
depending on some of the smaller ones, you use a piece of straw to help the structure and give a little airflow. Um, and you make this great little goat log. And what you get is two textures in the cheese. And what those two textures are, and the reason why I always get so excited about these types of cheese is because you're actually getting a snapshot of what happens as these types of cheeses age. Um, and so you're looking at a process called proteolysis. So the protein, I'm sorry, the molds on the outside of this cheese, probably like a penicillium camberti, um, are eating away at the protein structure left in the milk. And what you're left with is the fat structure. So you get the lipids left, which is why it's so gooey, but you still have this chalky center because quite frankly, the molds haven't gotten to there yet. If you let this cheese sit forever, uh, or not forever, for a couple more weeks, this would get smaller and smaller. Eventually it would look like a brie. Now this cheese isn't meant to go that ripe. Um, the rind would start to go gray and brown before that. They want it to be this bullseye. They want it to be, um, you know, two cheeses in one. I always joke, it's like when you get a reversible sweater. That's what this kind of cheese is. You're getting, you know, the crumbly, kind of really tangy, lactic, almost harsh goat cheese. And then you're getting the soft breakdown. Uh, real quick, a couple of people asked about the center. They don't necessarily have as distinct of a white center as, as yours does on the screen. Can you talk about that? And people want to know if that's okay, if that's what's, what's the Yeah, difference? it's totally fine. And it just means that it's, little riper or a little less ripe, um, depending on where it is. It's almost like if you were cooking a, a Chateaubriand, right? The end cuts, the end steaks, the long um, loin are gonna be more well done than the center. And so depending on where you are in the log, you might not see as much. Um, also depending on how much trouble cutting this log gave the cheesemongers, they might've um, not given just perfect cross sections and started to do some uh, more creative cutting. So. Yeah, hopefully that's helpful. And you know, all of the cheese is edible, all of it's delicious. And this is a great example of that rind. So how, um, where you should try it if you haven't, how I've been cutting this cheese is, you know, depending on how thick your piece is, sometimes it's nice to make it a little thinner um, and then cut yourself a little pie piece, right? But you wanna make sure you have the center as much as you can, as well as the edges. And then you're gonna go ahead and do exactly like we talked before, eat that center first and then go towards the rind. If you like everything that's going on and it's not too salty or too goaty, go ahead and eat the rind. And hopefully you'll see it does change the experience. Um, it offers to me at least not just more saltiness, but it really offers um, almost like a pillowiness. I, I know that's like a, more of a texture, but I get like a, a little bit more of like fallen earth, a little bit more of that like um, puffball mushroom, you know, just a really mild, you know, earthy flavor. Uh, this cheese is really fun for both the red, I'm sorry, the rosé and the white. For me, I much prefer the rosé on this cheese. And I'm going to post in the next 24 hours what I did with the rest of my cheese after I tasted it. So we just tasted it for the sake of getting, you know, uh, information for my tasting. And then we had a nice chunk oh, bigger than this. I actually breaded it and fried it at home. And so because this is such a, um, I guess, lean cheese, it doesn't have a huge fat content and it's not like so gooey, you can actually just put it in a little egg wash cover it in panko or breadcrumbs and fry it on medium high. And if you do it slow and low enough, you get a little gooierness or more gooiness in the cheese. Um, we did it and smashed it on some crackers with honey. It was a really fun appetizer. I think this cheese, you know, I mentioned earlier that I had it sequenced after a manchego. But I think it's a much more intense bowl of cheese. I think it really gives you an example of uh, how soft cheeses can be more flavorful. I also think back to as you're thinking about what you're cooking right now, it really gives you that like salty brightness that makes you want to start making more salads. Um, crumbled into a salad, this would be great. Or if you did that fried puck on top and kind of let that warm your salad and you could kind of, you know, mash it all over everything. Um, it's a really fun way to work with this cheese. I saw a couple of questions come up, Benji. What, what, 
Yeah, so let's, uh, let's go out. back to the, the top. Um, can you explain the science behind what makes a cheese age well and what limits certain fresh cheeses? Yeah, totally. So um, I can do my best. I am, full disclosure, totally just a cheesemonger who likes to read. I have no scientific background. The only scientist in this company is Will, who is a geologist. So his, uh, his explanation would be probably more technically correct than mine, but uh, he knows dirt more than milk. So um, what is happening that allows cheeses to age? What defines a well-aged versus a poorly aged cheese? It's really a um, discussion of moisture management, right? There's a great French uh, saying that cheese as milks leap towards immortality, right? It's all about controlled spoilage. And so the higher the moisture, the harder that's gonna be. Also the harder the higher the fat. Um, when you're in culinary school or in uh, you know, hospitality business school, they teach you an acronym, Fat Tom. So what you need to make uh, foodborne illness happen or, or spoilage is Fat Tom. So you need fat, acid, time, temperature, oxygen, and moisture. Um, and some kind of combination that's not good. And so if you reduce the moisture on something a lot, all of a sudden you can't really spoil it as well. If you then reduce the oxygen exposure even more, well, now you're really getting to aging something. So if you think about a mozzarella ball, no rind, no protection, really high moisture. Uh, the only thing it has going for it is the acid's a little lower than a lot of other cheeses, but it's full moisture, fully exposed, has a high fat content. And then you think about a Gouda, which one's gonna age better? Well, the Gouda, no oxygen, much lower moisture. Um, you know, that's the whole idea of wax rinding those cheeses. So there's a lot of steps in between that of what you do to the curds and how hard you push and squeeze and how much you cut them that really determine those things. Um, and that's why when people, I'm sitting in front of 10 cheeses and they're like, how long will they last? It's like, well, there's 10 different answers to those questions. Uh, thank goodness, because otherwise I wouldn't really have a job. Our profession is almost knowing these timelines and being able to kind of squeeze a cheese and be like, two more weeks, then I'll be ready. Um, yeah. Did that answer that question? Yeah, I think that's good. Uh, what makes a cheese stinkier than others? Mm. So to answer that, you almost have to define stinky. So a lot of times when I'm talking to um, a customer or a new employee, they'll say things like, oh, that blue cheese is so stinky. To us as cheesemongers, stinky is a technical term almost. And you think of stinky as washed rind cheeses. Um, let's grab one. One of the more classic examples, Telegio, right? It has this beautiful orange color. Um, and so they'll call that schmear ripen sometimes or washed rind cheese. And what you're literally doing to this young cheese is you're using a, a, a salt solution or alcohol and you're rubbing the cheese with brushes as it's aging and you're killing all the molds that are growing on the surface and creating a, a surface that's really not conducive to mold growth and instead is conducive to a specific bacterium, Bevobacterium linium or B. linens. And that is what cheesemongers call stinky cheese is that smell. Um, Bevobacterium linium is very closely related to a bacteria you would find in your armpits or your feet. I believe there's Bevobacterium in that area as well. And so that's why we think of stink. But many people find blue cheese to be an off-putting smell. But um, like cheesemongers or like the technical term is it's not stinky. It's, it's a blue cheese. It just smells like blue cheese. So, um, you know, breeze also are a funny one like that. Like I would never use the term brie, uh, stinky for a brie because it's not a washed rind cheese, but a really flavorful brie is really quite pungent and funky. And so um, whether you use stinky or just uh, earthy or other terms, uh, yeah, there's a variety of things that can kind of give that, but Bevobacterium linium is the, the culprit usually for very stinky things. Um, the orange, orange rind you just showed, is it similar to the rind of a Munster? Oh, I'm so happy you asked that. So. Um, it is similar in the sense that the rind of a Munster is them mimicking that rind. We love Munster cheese in this country. Um, and what we fell in love with originally was an Alsatian cheese called Munster, eaten really young. So they made really stinky cheeses, the Bavarian you know, immigrants that came to this country. And we like to eat them before they got funky and slice them and put it on your sandwich. Um, and 
So it would have had that orange rind because it's a young washed rind cheese. And it was eventually, as we started to eat more processed cheese, they just drew the line up. So they use a natto, the same thing we used to make cheddar orange to draw a line around it to look like it's a Munster. Yeah. Perfect. I think you're, you're good to go now. Cool. Cool. Um, all right. So we talked about the Ruo de Capra. Um, and like I said, follow us on Instagram. It'll probably be on both my personal Instagram as well as the um, company's Instagram account. So I'm at cheesemonger underscore Zach underscore Berg and then Monger's Provisions. So you can get some tips on what to do with your leftovers if there are any. Um, so for the last cheese, we have a big reveal. Um, you guys all have this cheese in front of you. So you should have already seen how pretty it is. But as we cut this cheese, so much of it kind of falls to the floor. And uh, because we cut so many of these wedges for everybody for this tasting, the staff thought we were out of it. Um, and when I got in, I found a wheel in the bottom, which I was really excited about because I get to show you a full wheel of this beautiful cheese. So, oh, the next cheese is Elk Blossom. Um, this is a really fun cheese. And I think, um, you know, something I didn't talk a lot about with the Spanish cheese, the last one is kind of this interplay between ingenuity and tradition and doing what your grandfather did, but also putting your own mark on things. And so, uh, you know, the Spanish making a French style of cheese was really kind of revolutionary in the mid eighties, this idea of them tipping their hat to other cultures and trying to play and try new things. And I think that cheese is a very similar example. Uh, if anybody really wants to listen to a fairly nerdy cheese podcast, which I love, there's one, I guess it's not as nerdy as others called uh, Planet Money does an episode on the Swiss Cheese Consortium. And so Swiss cheese was fairly controlled and you know, kind of in four lanes. The government only gave subsidies if you made a cheese that fell into the consortium's cheeses. So if you made Gruyere, if you made Oppenzeller, if you made Stillsitzer, and if you made, um, oh, I wonder if it was Letivaz, um, another fourth cheese, that's the only way you could get a subsidy. So very few people made other cheeses. There wasn't as much creativity. You know, we think of the United States where we're making everybody else's cheese and then we're making original cheeses and, you know, everything in between or in France, you know, a country that uh, uh, was de Gaulle, uh, was it? whatever, it was famously said, how could I govern a group of people that made 200 plus cheeses, you know? Um, most cultures really like to have a lot of variety and the Swiss, at least in modern times, really had very little variety. And so at a certain point when the Swiss Cheese Consortium no longer uh, exists, you have a influx of new cheeses coming from this area. Um, and it's really fascinating. You see some really cool cheeses. Columbia Cheese is an importer that we work with really closely. Um, they're the ones who bring us Hallerhocker and uh, De Schaffmax and uh, Schneebelhorn and all these really fun named cheese, named cheeses. And Alp Blossom was a cheese they were bringing in for a while. Um, and it really wasn't as popular, nor was it as colorful. It came in originally with much more field grasses and less field flowers. And it probably spent about two years in the American market not really making an impact. And then the importer um, decided he would cover it with flowers. And so he went to a local tea manufacturer in the area and he used a herb blend of flowers and, and things that would have come from the Alps of that area originally was the idea. And he started packing it that way and selling it. And it's been very funny for Will and I because um, we hear from them and their marketing somewhat they're like, oh, this was a cool new idea. And this is the first we've ever seen. And you know, yada, yada, yada. And then Will has some family in Switzerland and they recently gifted him some cheese of a very similar nature. And like, oh yeah, it's very common to like put out flowers on, on a cheese. And so, um, you know, it's kind of interesting. You hear, you don't think of cheese having trends and things like that, but I think it's still just like anything else does. Things come in vogue, things fall out of vogue, things that were done in the past are done again. And it's all of a sudden a really cool idea. I mean, this cheese is very much designed for Instagram. I'm looking around to see if I put the little baggie, here it is. Um, each wheel comes with extra flowers. So you can like make your perfect little post or your salt bay moment of like dropping the flowers around. 
Um, it's clearly a cheese that's designed for the age of Instagram, but it also, I think, does a great job of transporting you to that, that alpine meadow. Um, for those of you who've ever had elk blossom from us before, you might notice that it's a different flower mix. It's heavy on the rose petals. Um, they experimented around February, or I guess before then, but for February to have some in Valentine's Day that looked like this. And I think that, um, I don't, I, I'm wondering if they're gonna go back to the old mix or if they really like the roses. I find that it totally changes the nose of the cheese, um, the smell of the cheese, uh, the flavors aren't as effective, but I definitely like it smells much more um, of that depth and like violet and darker floral smells, um, which is why I thought it goes really well with the Chianti. You know, Italian wine, you hear all sorts of different flavor notes of like violet, tobacco, dried floral uh, notes, especially in your Barolos and things like that. And so I thought this, you know, dusty floral smell um, and flavor note from the Chianti would go so well with the Alp Blossom, which really um, is an expression of that. Um, some of the kind of ideas behind a cheese that's this colorful is so much of mountain cheese tradition is cheeses that are aged for a year, two years plus. Um, they're these big 80 pound wheels and those are really fun and that's definitely the, the more serious versions of mountain cheeses, but you also have smaller wheels that are meant to be eaten within the year and be a little more of an expression expression of freshness. Um, and I always enjoy kind of, we tend to bring out blossom back in the beginning of every spring to kind of mark the flowers coming out. And, a, you know, instead of the cheese that in Christmas is like super nutty and big and like, you know, the celebratory cheese, this is kind of the fun, season's changing, get outside, get barbecue going, you know, um, start making cheese trays a little more fanciful and floral. So uh, we always use Elf Blossom to kind of mark the season here. Um, the other big marking of the season that I kind of glossed over, which we had a sheep and a goat intentionally because part of spring, um, you know, it happens a little bit before is this lambing and kidding season. I think most people who don't grow up in an agricultural area don't realize that the, uh, the birth cycle of those animals is a finite, it happens in specific times, you know. Um, cows, if you actually gave them full grazing and like let the limb live a more natural life cycle, they'll also fall into a season, not quite as strictly, but uh, you know, Idle Farm stops making, stops getting milk at a certain point right around, you know, Christmas time. It's always this, you know, measure between idle grease, like how are we gonna get them through New Year? Are we gonna run out before, the, the goats dry up essentially, and then the goats get a much needed break, right? And they get to just hang out during winter until they start having babies again. And then with a new batch of babies, you get new fresh milk. You give it a couple of days or weeks until the mothers can be, uh, I'm sorry, the babies can be weaned off the mother's milk and you can actually start getting milk for, uh, for cheese making purposes. But it's really, you know, the spring really, you know, late winter, early spring is this beginning of like, all of a sudden we have all the cheese available to us. And it's a really fun time to see fresh new cheeses and really fun floral cheeses. Our palates start changing. And although we're still looking to like, hopefully eat a lot of cheese and melt cheese into our dishes, our food kind of goes from really heavy gratins and uh, cassoulets to lighter food where a little fresh salad and some bright cheese is, you know, all you really want. Cool. We have a we have a few questions that have come your way. Um, so uh, first, um, you know, in the chat for those interested, um, it was asked for the four cheeses we have tonight. What's the order of for how long they will last? Will mentioned in there. Um, went through them so you can see them written out. Rule de Capra, Idle Pastures only after opened, El Blossom and Menchego. So definitely check that out in his explanation there. Um, I wanted to make that clear. Um, what's an example of a classically American cheese? Ooh, great. So. Um... I think one of the oldest recipes that is still being made and celebrated is Jack. Jack is a pretty early cheese in the American story, um, really made from like different missionary groups that were in the west side of the country. Um, definitely comes from, you know, like Monterey Jack. It comes from California. You have things like Vela Dry Jack and some of these more elevated versions of Jack, but Jack cheese is a truly American original. 
Um, American cheese, American processed cheese is an American original. Um, and if anybody really wants to hear a little bit more about kind of American cheese versus a cheese made in America, there's a fun TEDx available online um, of myself talking about the story of American cheese and kind of giving you a brief snapshot of that. But uh, the American Cheese Society, the people who make that pin and gave me the certification as an, uh, a cheese professional, they've opened up the categories in the last couple of years to have American original as its own category. And then they have subcategories of like best dry jack, best uh, telemay as an American concept. Uh, Franklin's telemay is the one that I'm the most familiar with, but telemay is almost like uh, if cream cheese and string cheese had an illegitimate child, it's this crazy like Jabba the Hutt type textured cheese. It takes the shape of whatever container you put it in. Uh, but that's an American original kind of a, uh, uh, play on a uh, scramorza or not a scramorza either way an Italian type of cheese so perfect crescenza uh, there you go can play you, on that. can you usually tell what the cows or goats or sheep have eaten um, once you taste the cheese so not super directly like I'm not uh, I'm thinking of the Napoleon dynamite scene where he's like drinking it and he, the milk and he's like they got into an onion patch it's not as direct as that um, but I do think you can taste whether or not they're eating fresh uh, feed or if they're eating a fermented feed. You know, in cheddars, you're not allowed to use fermented feed. So um, for those of us who don't really have a background on feed, uh, if you cut all your grass and it's really kind of wet outside and you just put all the grass in the, in the barn, it doesn't turn into hay, it rots. Um, and you can either dry it and get a hay maker um, or you can actually inoculate it with a starter culture and ferment your grass. And then it's silage and it's, it's held for the winter. And so um, very common in colder climates to have silage. And um, so you don't necessarily have um, silage in, you know, you wouldn't have that fermented feed in a lot of cheeses and cheddars. Uh, you're not allowed to by, by law. And then you get to a cheese called like Lincolnshire poacher um, and all of a sudden it tastes tangier because they're actually doing that. So I think you can taste the seasonality. You can taste some of the qualities. Um, it's hard for me to taste the feed. I actually would almost find it easier to taste the, uh, sometimes it's easier to taste the herd, like what kind of cows it is. And I know that sounds like, how is that even possible? But the composition of different cows is different. So like Jersey milk is by far the fattiest cow's milk. And it's like, well known for that. Holstein tends to not be and uh, it tends to be leaner and the most abundant milk. I always get a weird raspberry note on Holstein milk. Um, Asher is these really fat gobules that are like really large and really almost gives you a piquant flavor. Um, and so, as, you know, it takes tasting them side by side. Like the only reason I can do any of that is because a cheese called Bailey Hazen used to be made with Asher cows, then they made it with Holstein, then they made milks. And so you like can train your palate by eating those. Um, you know, the, the normal consumer doesn't get an opportunity to do those side by sides. And so it's, it's hard, but uh, you know, when you have a cheese that's rotationally grazed um, like Idle Pastures, or I'm thinking of Pleasant Ridge Reserve uh, out of Uplands Dairy, you know, Andy is the cheese maker. And I assume Melissa also, they can look at the milk in the vat or taste the curd and be like, oh, the cows are in this part of the field today. because if there's a big hill on the field, like that's gonna produce a different grass than in the shadowy part underneath that. And so um, the composition of the milk changes every day. And that's why it's so important to buy milk on the smaller scale or buy cheeses that are made on this smaller scale because you're tasting like, it's like a time capsule, right? I'm tasting what did the field taste like on this day? What did the cows get into? And while I can't tell you all that, uh, what grasses they are, you totally can tell the difference. Um, the last note on that, because I feel like that was a hell of a tangent, is in the color of the milk, you can see a lot. So goat's milk, they don't pass uh, beta keratin through their fat at all. So that's why goat's milk is always bone white. This, the color thing doesn't happen. But with sheep and cow's milk, um, you can see an orange hue or a yellow butterfat color when a cheese is grass fed. Uh, and that really changes in seasons. I'm trying to look for one in our case right now. Um, yeah, 
yeah, there's not a great bright yellow one right now, but trust me, that 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 is definitely a visual change. It looks a lot more like the Manchego has that bright orangeness. Yeah. Um, cool. Some more questions. Um, can a cheese go so bad it becomes dangerous? Yeah, great question. And it's actually um, in today's day and age where we're all buying groceries for as like long as we possibly can do it and stress testing it, it's come up a lot from my friends and family asking me. Um, cheese is essentially a cured product, like a salami. And what I mean is it's gone through this great epic battle of survival of the fittest bacteria to become a cheese. And so the really dangerous stuff um, lost by virtue of the cheese being in existence, right? Um, there are a handful of things that exist that that's not true about. The real one you hear about the most often is Listeria. And if Listeria is in the cheese, doesn't matter how much you abuse the cheese or don't abuse the cheese, Listeria is in the cheese. And so that's why we rely on really, um, you know, cheesemakers who are rigorously uh, testing their cheese and paying attention to those things and so hygienic and uh, yeah. But if you let a cheese go bad in your fridge, right, it's not going to make you sick, most likely. The exceptions to that rules are if something grows on the cheese from the flora of your fridge, and that's actually most likely what's going to happen. So um, if it grows a little green or blue fuzz, cut that fuzz off if it's a hard cheese and keep going. If it grows black mold or pink spots, that's when you want to start thinking about just throwing it out right? The, the pink is going to be a wild yeast that probably came from something in your fridge. I'm not going to speak to that being all right. The black mold is black mold and you don't want to ingest either of those. But if it looks like it's a little green or a little, you know, white film or any of those things, scrape it off, smell. If it still smells all right, you're fine. You can cook with it especially. Um, I really think that, uh, you know, cheese is a little bit more bulletproof than we give it credit for. What will most likely happen first is it's going to dry out and get too salty and unpalatable before it goes so bad that it grows new things and nothing in it is going to go bad in the way that like rotten meat would go. A um, couple more questions. Um, back to the out blossom. How do they decide what flowers or herbs they use traditionally? And there's usually a different flavor profile between one or the other and all that fun yeah. stuff. Totally is going to affect it. And I hope that you at this point have tasted the cheese. I didn't want to open the wheel just so you guys got a visual of me snacking on cheese. But uh, especially if you eat it with the rind, I think you're going to get like an explosion of those flavors. I always get like a rosemary hit. Definitely the roses come through in this one. Um, sometimes there's almost like a little lavenderness going on. And so it totally affects what blend is on the cheese. Will and I recently had one that had hay flowers and it totally had like a more cereal note, um, less herbaceousness. It tasted like hay flowers. I don't know. Um, and you see, you know, there's a handful of cheeses that have that kind of, you know, being encapsulated in different herb blends throughout the world. So like the uh, Corsican cheese, Fleur de Maquis is rosemary specifically in junipers and that really takes on those flavors. And so whatever you cover in it would have a flavor effect um, Norbert is the gentleman who, for Columbia cheese, on the European side, buys all these cheeses, consolidates, and imports them. He was the guy who, uh, he credits himself with coming up with this idea and trying to move more of this cheese that wasn't working. Um, and he says, at least the stories I've heard, is that he went to a tea company that works in that area and asked for a mix that would be, um, you know, that would be part of the terroir of that region. So he wanted a mix that was indigenous to that region. He didn't want to cover it with like evergreens or something if there's no evergreens in the region. Um, do any of the cheeses pair with anything else very well, such as like manchego and honey is mentioned as a yeah. kind of classic, but what else is there with these particular cheeses? Great questions. You guys are, by the way, this is a very good question group so far. Uh, thank you so, so much for it. The manchego, you know, the classic pairing is with membrio with a quince paste. Um, Quince is not as common. I'm just looking to see if we have any to show you. Quince is, a, it looks kind of like a cross between a pear and an apple. And it's a large fruit. It's not actually edible out of hand. You need to cook it. And when you cook it, it turns this beautiful pink color. And you'll often see manchego and quince together on a plate with some jamon. Um, and it's similar to a guava paste you would see in South America. And they would actually eat it with a, you know, Manchego from that region, which is a different cheese. Um, 
And so, yeah, the manchego, I like with sweeter things. It's so salty and kind of that meaty term that I mentioned earlier, that having it with sweeter things tends to work for me or playing up that meatiness and adding it with jamon. Um, the, you know, the fennel pollen, to me, it's just all about those spring flavors and the things you would find growing right now. So whether or not you're talking about like a really beautiful morel mushroom dish with the fennel pollen and garlic flavors together, um, you know, sauteing up some morels and then letting this kind of the a dab of that cheese on there soften and almost melt over after I already have my sauteed morels would be really nice. Um, or working it into like a, um, we used to make a, a pasta at a restaurant I worked at called RN74, which was uh, pea tendrils, pasta water, and goat cheese. And so uh, pasta water can be really delicious. And I think that many recipes tell you to kind of keep that water that you've cooked your pasta in. But if you literally just start a pan with some onions and olive oil and put pea tendrils or any kind of um, hearty, not heartier green, but something that has a little bit, you don't want something that's gonna fall apart right away like spinach. So even if you did something like a kale maybe um, and you saute it a little bit and then you start putting butter and pasta water in and mounting those together until you get enough sauce and a little bit of goat cheese to bind it, you can get this really light sauce, um, perfect summer pasta. And then, you know, some English peas at the end to kind of, uh, yeah, garnish at the end. Perfect. Um, so why do cheese producers use cheese from different farms? And wouldn't that mean that each pass of cheese would taste slightly different? When you say that, do you mean milk from different farms? Yeah, I, be I believe so, yes. yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's a variety of reasons, right? The first one is that most cheesemakers are small business owners and they're trying to help other small business owners. You know, cheese is an industry that takes a great deal of infrastructure and land. And so when you start closing and consolidating cheese factories or companies, the landscape changes quite like literally of your area. So if you're talking about a company like Jasper Hill Cellars, who I like to talk about a lot, they're out of Vermont and Andy and Mateo, they often say that they started their whole company so they're, you know, the landscape they grew up with would look like the landscape they grew up with. All these dairy farms were closing and whether it turns into a condo association or something else, it changes the like makeup of your society, your community. Um, if you're talking about places like Wisconsin, you know, the, the structure of like cities on highways, it was often de designated based on the distance between uh, milk pooling stations and the local farms. Every kind of little grouping of cities would have one cheese factory. Um, and then that changes over time. And so I think that part of it is a matter, matter of preservation, right? Preserving the culture of the area and the businesses that exist there. Um, but yeah, it's also about expressing different fields, right? Just like a winemaker might buy um, some Chardonnay from Santa Barbara and then some Chardonnay from Paso Robles and he either is gonna make two distinct wines and then a third blended, you know, it's the ingredients you get to play with. And so um, often you'll have creameries buying up different herds or buying from different families to get different quality. Um, you know, Jasper is a really great example because they've bought herds as they've brought new cheeses on, right? They started making Alpha Tolman, which was a mountain style cheese. And that cheese didn't work well with their Asher cows or their Holstein cows. So they had to acquire a herd of brown Swiss to make a mountain style cheese. And so kind of back to the genetics of the cows and the different consistency of the milk, it really does matter. And so, uh, yeah, it, it's just like you get to play with your raw ingredient then. Cool. Um, before I get to more questions, Will is uh, going to speak for a moment. So I'm going to put Thank him you. on the screen and uh, go for it, Will. Um, so just to, just to piggyback on what Zach was saying, you know, when you're pulling milk from different farms, you're, one, you, you could create cheese that tastes different from, from um, batch to batch. But if you pull milk from enough different farms consistently enough, what you're also doing is creating the possibility of having homogeneity in your product, right? If you, if you have a diverse enough source um, all the time, you can actually create a more consistent product than you could if you were making cheese from one farm 
and then another farm. So, so sometimes that's a reason to, to source from different locations. Um, and that's very similar to what happens in chocolate too. You know, with commercial chocolate, it's the same idea. If you use one source of beans all the time um, and one farm, right, your, your chocolate's gonna change from season to season and harvest to harvest. Um, but if you start to source beans from hundreds of different farms from Africa and South America and you know all over the world, you can actually take those and blend them in the right way so that your product tastes the same every year. So that's all I've got. No. Thank you. That's a great point. Um, and you know, to that kind of point earlier of can you taste what the cows ate, you know, Will's point about the homogeneity, like if one of your producers did have all the cows get into the onion patch, having a larger source and being able to blend that through or um, being able to not, you know, just say, I'm not actually gonna take this milk today. Most of the really cool operations I've been to, um, they're testing milk upon arrival and many of them will actually pay a different premium based on the composition. So if you're hitting different criteria, fat content or acid, uh, you know, windows, and you're making, you're bringing me the milk I want, I'll pay you a premium. And that's often how these artisan cheesemakers are working. Um, question that we've gotten from a few different people tonight, um, figure still on cheese. So what's the best way to store cheese and what's the best way to kind of wrap that leftover cheese up? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, the best way to store cheese is in your belly. You should buy the right amount of cheese and come visit us more often or place our orders more often. You know, and I, I will answer the question, but full full reality is that like, our job is to store cheese, not yours. You should buy cheese and eat it and enjoy it within, I think five days of the purchase is a really like an ideal cheese consumption. Um, but for a firmer cheese, you are gonna have anywhere from seven to 10 days before you start to get into the zone where the cheese is really drying out, picking up off flavors from the fridge. Um, really seven to 10 days, I would say is your window. For a cheese like a Parmesan, go to two weeks, three weeks, Shit, if it's a month, it's probably gonna be all right. Um, and then for softer cheeses, you're much closer to that five to ten, seven days. You know, it just depends on it. A burrata that you opened up yesterday, like in two days, that's gonna to start to taste really sour and off. Um, but a fresh goat cheese like this is gonna be good in the fridge for, you know, at least a solid week once you break the seal. Cool. Um, uh, and then real quick to actually um, answer the question properly of the best way to wrap, um, the best way to wrap is cheese paper. If you don't have your own uh, cheese paper, then I like to use uh, parchment paper and you wrap the cheese in parchment paper and then you saran wrap that. Um, the idea is that you don't want it to be in a perfectly air-free environment. I don't want it in a Ziploc bag. I don't want it in the Tupperware. I don't want just the saran wrap because eventually what will happen is the cheese will suffocate. Um, cheese is off-gassing ammonia and if it is in a totally anaerobic environment, it will absorb that ammonia and it will just taste like ammonia, no matter how much you let it air out. And so what you're trying to avoid is, is that. And so a slightly looser wrap with the paper is the key. And then don't put it on the top shelf of your fridge. That's where the most air mo movement is. You want it in the crisper drawer or somewhere lower in the fridge. Cool. Um, just a couple more questions and I'll let you get to that chocolate because I know some people are, are hankering for it. Um, so it. how should we shop for cheese? Which cheese are good from the grocery store? Which should we come to for mongers? Um, and once in mongers, what are some good questions to ask to get exposed to these newer cheeses? Yeah, this is a great set of questions. You know, I think that any cheese shop where there's somebody in the cheese section is a great place or any grocery store where there's a cheese section and someone behind it. So Obviously, I want you to buy everything from Mongers, but um, Whole Foods and Murray's slash Kroger's have done really great work over the last decade, growing their cheese departments, growing their cheese knowledge. Um, so a place where there is someone to ask questions is a really, it's a big unlock, right? Having some place where there's a dialogue and not just, I'll grab this because it looks fun. Um, so looking for a place where there's a cheesemonger Questions to ask, um, what tastes good today? Number one best question. Uh, it's starting to become my least favorite question. What's the best cheese or what's your favorite? Like I bought 150 cheeses. If there was one best cheese, 
wouldn't that be a really silly business model? Um, but what tastes good today kind of is more of a like, you know, this idea that cheese is alive. Some batches are better than other. Like that gets us excited. That kind of is code for, I'm in it. I know that it's not such a stagnant idea. What's tasting good right now? Some brands to keep an eye out for in grocery stores that are a little bit more common, um, especially nowadays, is I see a lot more Milton Creamery. Um, I see a lot more Cypress Grove. Um, Rothkoss uh, is a, a, Emmy Roth is the Swiss company and they have a Wisconsin company called Rothkoss USA. They're pretty good. Um, yeah, find a place where you can develop a relationship with the person selling you cheese and then they hopefully will find out what you like and give you better suggestions. Um, perfect. Uh, don't morning and evening milks produce different flavors or evening milkings? Sorry. Totally. That's a cheese person who knows what's up. Um, yeah, the, the time of day uh, produces different flavors, but almost more so than just the actual flavor difference between those is most often you let one of those acidify overnight and the other one you pour fresh cream in. So it's, it's less the actual flavor difference between the two and it's more of how they're handled. Um, very often cheeses are made by, you take evening milk that sat out throughout the evening and started to acidify and then you have a culture built into it. I pour fresh milk and start making cheese. And it's not so much that those tasted so totally different, it's just I let one acidify. Um, there would probably still be a taste difference. I just haven't had enough experience um, being on a farm to like taste those things to give you a great answer beyond that. Cool. Um, are there any hybrid cow, goat, sheep cheeses uh, where it mixes all the milks together? Yeah, very common. And, and you know, I think it's not as common for the reasons of like what Will was saying of this homogeneity and like, oh, this goat milk's a little lean, so I added a little sheep's milk to fatten it up, and oh, I wanted the cow to give me the structure. I think it's much more of a practical, like, I'm a small farmer, and I have a couple cows, a couple goats, and I got, um, you know, I got one cow, a couple goats, and a couple sheep. I just take all their milk, I make one cheese, right? And I think that's where those traditions and cheeses were made from. They're most often, um, I think you see it the most in Italian cheeses and roviolas, this mixed milk mixing of milks um but they're definitely they happen in america probably my favorite soft uh mixed milk is a kunik is a blend of uh i want to say cow and goat off the top of my head um that's a fun cheese we sometimes carry a castel babao which is all three milks or latour i think is on the menu or on the website right now and that's all three milks perfect um and last question uh how long does blue cheese last in the fridge traditionally yeah, you know, blue cheese, because it's um, already starting to get blue, has a really long runway on it. Um, I find that blue cheeses are going to be definitely past that week mark, getting to the two week. Um, they're going to get saltier and funkier, but they're, they're pretty hearty cheeses. They've kind of already gone through so much enzymatic reaction that there's, there's not a whole lot of uh, opportunity for spoilage left. Cool. All right. You were uh, yeah. good to go. I just saw Will mention Chandoka. That is a really fun cheddar. We were just reminiscing amongst us uh, the different cheesemongers because we like forget and love these old cheese. You're like, oh, Chandoka. I haven't seen that guy in a long time. We should bring him back around. So, uh, you know, three cheesemongers all had that same like wistful reaction when we brought it up last time. So I'd say in the next couple months, you'll see a Chandoka grace our counter which is a cow and goat cheddar. Really awesome cheese out of Wisconsin. Um, all right, friends. Are we time for, ready for some chocolate? Um, before I dive into chocolate, I just want to give a moment to plug Will. You know, Will is one of my absolute best friends, longest best friend, and he's uh, a very, very smart, smart guy. And He's done just an incredible amount of uh, work in chocolate and, and developing this kind of card catalog in his brain of knowledge. Uh, I know that I know a fair amount about cheese, but I've done this for about 12 years. Will's been in chocolate at this point going on about four or five years. Um, and he, I think, knows as much about chocolate as I do about cheese. It's really an impressive um, kind of department he's built within our store. And so at our store, we focus on this idea of bean to bar chocolate, craft chocolate. Um, and what that means is we're looking at chocolate from this lens of what happens if I grow beans in 
Ecuador versus Madagascar. And what does that change? How does that change the chocolate? Um, most of us grew up loving and kind of maybe gravitating towards Bavari or German chocolates or Belgian chocolates or Swiss chocolates. And none of those places actually uh, grow chocolate. They all are manufacturers of chocolate. And so we really want to tell that whole story. Where did this bean start? Um, we've always been about education and food. We want to tell these stories of our producers because they're too busy producing. Um, and we found with chocolate, it almost felt like there's more work to do. If I show a little kid a cow and I ask them what the cow makes, they can tell me milk and maybe from that cheese. If I show a little kid a cacao bean in this country, they have no clue what a cacao pod looks like, um, let alone this idea of how is it made. I think most adults, forget kids, don't actually know how chocolate goes from this beautiful pot in the tropics to being something that we now have as a bar. Um, and so we really focus on telling that story, talking about the geography and the cultures. You know, in general, our mission um, was this idea of showing people um, the multi, the many cultures of food. You know, there's no better way to get to know someone than to break bread with them and to, you know, eat their food and to get to know them. And so we wanted to do that. Cheese lends itself so naturally to these northern countries and the tropics kind of get left out for so much of at least cheese and fine meats, right? It's a really hot area. Um, you know, this idea of controlled spoilage doesn't work in the tropics. And so you get chocolate and you get coffee out of these regions. You know, chocolate has to be grown between 20 degrees north or south of the equator. Um, and I always like using the example as I can grow it in Cuba, but Southern Florida, 80 miles north doesn't work, right? And you can see cacao trees in these areas that uh, aren't the tropics, but they're not gonna be viable for manufacturing, right? I can go visit a cacao tree in the Belle Isle Conservatory and it fruits, but I don't know that I could make chocolate bars from it. It definitely doesn't have a high enough yield. Um, so we, uh, at this point in our shop, I believe we have the largest selection of this really cool uh, bean to bar kind of selection of chocolate in the state. So Will can probably clarify, but I think we're past like high 20s and different uh, places of origin. You know, if you're thinking about specifically like region to region or, or province or city to city, uh, in Nicaragua, Vietnam, Venezuela, and Peru, you can do a tasting where you're like, what does this city taste like versus that city? And have a much more granular discussion, similar to how you would talk about wine, right? Like we get really, in Bordeaux, people are talking about right bank versus left bank Bordeaux. And for us, with the chocolate you actually should have in your box, you can do that, but it's the Mekong Delta. What's the difference between chocolate from Bayrai versus uh, Ben Trey, I believe. I don't have the map in front of me, so I apologize. Um, but what's the difference between these different regions within Southern Vietnam and what their effect on the cacao is? Um, so terroir is this big word I used earlier. This French word means taste of place. And I think that a lot goes into the terroir of chocolate. There's, you know, the elevation of where you're getting it from, the rainfall. Um, and then, you know, Will talks about how the drying almost becomes an effect because usually that would be part of the manufacturing, right? Like you don't talk about the way the wine's made as part of the terroir, it's just the growing. But for cacao, I have to dry the beans, right? And so that's maybe not that hard in Tanzania, but it's really hard in Bali. In Bali, there's a lot of waterfall. Um, I'm probably not gonna have like a glassed in perfect structure where I'm drying my beans. I have a much more rustic setup. And so they're gonna be mechanically dried is the term that they would use. Mechanically drying means that I'm actually drying them over fire over heat. And so um, I think it is a stretch from like a purist definition of terroir, but I think Will's right. You can't get the beans out of there without getting this like taste of smoke that comes from drying beans in Bali. And so it has an effect um, how the drying of the chocolate happens. And so all of this is hopefully uh, something you can pay attention to and experience a little bit more when you're tasting a dark chocolate that's from a single origin. It's, you know, to Will's point earlier about the blending, you're getting a much more specific set of information and therefore all of a sudden I can compare it to the other piece of information. What does this one taste like versus this one? 
Uh, most chocolate commercially available is being sourced primarily from West Africa and a really high percentage. I've heard everything between 75 and 85% of the world's cacao is coming from that Cote d'Or uh, area. And so, um, yeah, it's, you know, it gives you a really specific type of flavor, but I also think it, they're way more prone to use this blending technique. So Hershey's tastes like Hershey's regardless of the weather that year. Um, and so Maru, the company that you're hopefully enjoying, they have really tried to create and elevate the coffee, I'm sorry, the chocolate culture already existing in Vietnam. So chocolate's been grown in Vietnam ever since French colonialism. The French loved chocolate. As soon as they had a um, colony or territories in the tropics, of course they were gonna bring over the cacao trees and start trying to do it. Um, Will got a chance to visit them when he was in Vietnam. Uh, he can tell you a lot about that story. and. You know, I think it's interesting what the two gentlemen who own this company were doing is they're taking a product that was grown, you know, in the area and was sold to the commodity market without any love or without any intention, and they kind of took it back. And one of the first things they did, and one of the things that I think makes them really cool is that they try to develop a Vietnamese co or chocolate culture. It's not just about making the product and another thing we export and just making better margin on it. It's about creating a culture where they can appreciate how special it is of what they're doing. Um, so now there's two or three cafes throughout Southern Vietnam where someone can go and have uh, drinking chocolate or a nice little bonbon or something with chocolate grown and made in Vietnam. They also, when they choose to make things with inclusions, they focus on Vietnamese ingredients. So I think everybody here is in agreement that chocolate with nuts can be really tasty, but we find inclusions that kind of play off the culture of the origin to be much more interesting. So um, they make a really great coconut milk bar, no milk in there because they couldn't find powdered milk in Vietnam, but they can find powdered coconut milk. And so uh, they have a coconut milk chocolate. They also have a kumquat chocolate with kumquats that are grown in the same area as the cacao beans. So really cool inclusions. Um, another brand that I'll kind of dovetail off of that idea of cool inclusions that I really like is Mirzam. Mirzam's out of Dubai, out of the United Arab Emirate. And they're doing chocolate that has like jaggery sugar in it, which is a date sugar or a palm sugar. They're doing a white chocolate with mango or a, um, you know, a cardamom and coffee bar that's like so much of a Turkish coffee. It's, it's really a beautiful bar. What other questions do we have, friends, about chocolate, about cheese? Um, I know there's some discussion going on uh, with Will and some others about Hershey's chocolate versus uh, this kind of chocolate. So that's always a, a fun conversation amongst, amongst friends. I'm going to just throw in my favorite fact on this. A Hershey's extra special dark, 46% cacao. I think that that shouldn't be called dark chocolate at that point. You're not even breaking the 50 threshold. We have plenty of milk chocolates here that have a higher cacao content than that. So, and with that, that means your sugar content goes way down. So for those who are, you know, like the indulgence of a chocolate, but are concerned about sugar intake, um, if you like milk chocolate, eat dark milks. There's not a lot of room for sugar. Um, can you talk about the percentages a little bit different not to be yeah. on that topic? Yeah, thank you. So um, the percentages in chocolate is the percentage of things in the bar derived from the cacao tree from thrombium cacao. And the reason I don't say cacao period, but derived from is because there's kind of two things. There's cocoa butter and then there's cocoa solids. And so if I have a bar that's 70% or 72%, I'm saying 72% of the contents of this bar is either cocoa butter or cocoa solids. Um, we really focus on bars that have very few ingredients. So if you take this idea of inclusions out, right, the nuts, or the cardamom or whatever, most of our bars are two, three ingredient chocolates. So they have cocoa, they have sugar, that's it. Maybe they have some soy lecithin as a, um, it helps with textures and as a preservative, but they don't have, you know, 50 different things. And I think that that makes a really big difference. Um, and um, yeah, that's a big part of the percentage. So you can change, the um, 
the percentage, you know, within the 70%, you could have a bar that has a lot more cocoa butter and less cocoa solids. And I could make one that's a lot um, more brittle and dry that has lower cocoa butter and a lot more cocoa solids, still within the 70%. Uh, cool. Um, do we have any Greek chocolate at the store? You know, we do not have any Greek chocolate. I don't, my sense of geography and the map's too far away. I don't know if they're in the region where they would be able to grow chocolate. Will, do you know? Um, no, 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 thank they, you. They don't, they don't grow cacao that far north. Okay, and so we could find some Greek manufactured chocolate, but that, you know, we really try to do more focus on the countries of origin. Um, so for American chocolate, for instance, we only have one that's actually made at origin, which is Hawaii. Benji got to visit them when he was on his honeymoon, um, but Manoa chocolate in Hawaii is one of the only producers we have that is growing cacao in America and making chocolate in America. Um, but yeah, Greece would be a country where it would just be manufactured. Cool, a couple more chocolate questions and we also have a cheese question. Um, is cool. the sugar regulated in dark chocolate? Um, no, I don't believe, like, I mean, I don't think they have to disclose exact, I mean, nutritional information has to be disclosed depending on how many people are in your company. But I don't think that like, there's a target if it's 70%, you can't have X amount of sugar. Um, that is not controlled. Uh, we have a Cadbury chocolate question. So Cadbury chocolate in England uses their fresh cream. What, do you, what are your thoughts on, on that brand of chocolate? I, you know, somebody asked in the last one we did this, if I ate lint chocolate, and uh, I'm going to use one of my favorite terms, which is, or coined phrases. I'm a fat kid that turned pro. So I, I enjoy almost all garbage candy. Um, growing up when we were in San Francisco, or not growing up, but when Will and I lived in San Francisco, I would always eat all of his Easter candy that his mom sent him because Will wouldn't touch it. Um, and so uh, I'm maybe not the greatest mark of whether or not I enjoy something. Cadbury chocolate can be delicious. I, I love dairy. And so the fact that it tastes of that fresh cream so much, I, I enjoy it more than a Hershey bar. Um, but if I was looking to do that and know that I was putting good, honest food in my belly, um, you know, the chocolate I would go to here actually is we have a water buffalo milk chocolate that is crazy creamy. Water buffalo has the richest um, milk of any of the animals that we genuinely or generally eat their cheese. And so I think it's just cool that they put it into a chocolate bar and it's so creamy. Um, it almost gives you a Cadbury like effect. So yep. try the water buffalo chocolate. Um, an Italian cheese question for you. Can you compare and contrast Pecorino and Parmigiano Reggiano so we know what to look for in each? Yeah, so literally we do a cheese 101 class, um, not so for the public, but for our mongers. And that is a question on the test. So uh, we have a couple of our staff members watching. So if I fail this question, I'm gonna get really razzed at home. Um, so the big difference between those two cheeses is the milk type, right? Parmigiano Reggiano is a cow's milk cheese. Pecorino is a sheep's milk cheese. Um, and then the age of the cheeses is gonna change. Uh, Parmigiano Reggiano, in order to get its export stamp, has to be a year. Most of the parm we eat in this country falls past to 24 months. Uh, Pecorinos can vary in size depending on the region. So if you're thinking of like a little Tuscan Pecorino, Pecorino Toscano, they're about five pound wheels. They can only go for six to eight months before they get too dry and too brittle. Um, and if you're talking about a Pecorino Romano, it's an 80 pound wheel. It can take a little bit more time, but it doesn't have as thick of a crust or a, a rind as a parm. So you're not going to see Pecorino Romano that's 24 months. You're going to see it in that, you know, six to eight months. Um, what you're looking for, I guess, is someone who can answer those questions, right? You want it to be specific and not just like Pecorino from Italy, right? It's kind of like wine where the more specific the circle I'm drawing, the better it probably is. If I'm buying California red wine, it's not nearly as good as Napa red wine, which is not nearly as good as like Howell Mountain, you know, this vineyard left side, that's the best. And so the smaller the circle, the better. And so if I'm looking at a store and it's just Parmigiano Reggiano, cool. And then I look to the next one and it's, um, you know, this guy's Parmesan already, you know, Crevero Parmesan like ours, then all of a sudden I'm, I'm speaking more 
specifically of where that Parmesan is coming. So, um, you know, we can tell you the name of the family farm that's making our Parmesan, and then we can tell you who ages our Parmesan and how we get it. We know all those pieces, and that's how you know it's a really special Parmesan. Um, and same thing for the Pecorinos. You want to look for something that's Pecorino al Sardo or Pecorino, you know, of this village. That's going to be a better than just Italian Pecorino. Um, and I think that the more information, the more kind of transparent the cheese is, uh, the better quality it probably is. Um, how does one become a cheesemonger? How can they become you? <laughs> <laughs> it's a painful life. No, um, it's a lot of cheese. Uh, how do you become a cheesemonger? You know, there's no, currently there's no like school. Um, I did hospitality business school at Michigan State and cooked my whole life. And uh, when I got a job at Zingerman's, I guess the short answer is get a job at a cheese counter. Um, I got a job at a shop called Zingerman's in Ann Arbor. Shout out to them. Really one of the most uh, respected cheese shops in the country and very focused on education. And I can remember having this epiphany cheese moment where I ate a piece of a, a French cheese called Debutu and was blown away. And I literally turned to the guy who served it to me and I was like, where have you all been hiding this stuff? Like, how did no one tell me cheese was this delicious and exciting? Um, they quickly realized that they shouldn't answer my questions and should just hand me books. And so I read a lot and studied a lot. And uh, eventually I got to lead most of their public tastings, much like we're doing tonight. And uh, that's really how I honed in on my skills. The industry has grown up a lot in the 12 years I've been involved. Um, and so now there's a certification test. And there's also this really fun competition called the Cheesemonger Invitational. In 2014, I got second place uh, nationwide, which was really exciting and kind of uh, helped spark my career even more. And I got written up in the San Francisco Chronicle and things like this. But, you know, to me, it's eating cheese, it's reading, um, and it's kind of, uh, this is going to sound really cheesy, no pun, in, or all puns intended, but uh, to join the industry, like it's kind of a fun cheese fam. Um, you know, it's, there's only a fair few amount of conferences and things we all attend. So you see the same people every time and uh, you learn a lot by being part of that community. Um, should you refrigerate chocolate? No, um, unless you live in a really, really warm environment where you're not able to, to maintain temperatures in the house below 78 degrees or so. Um, it's not necessary. You want to put it in a cool, dark place. The cabinet in your cupboard or your, you know, kitchen cabinet is fine. Um, you want to wrap it again and again, you know, either in the foil or if it really gets all torn up, parchment paper or something like that. Oxygen is much, is, isn't much of an issue. So if you needed to put it in a Ziploc bag, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, just, you know, it's about the temperature more than anything and moisture for chocolate. Cool. Um, that seems to be, be the questions for now. I don't know if there's anything else you, you want to add or let people. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, the one thing I didn't talk enough about or at all about is we didn't really go through this language about how I do a pairing. Um, so I could do a quick rundown of that, uh, which is just this idea that you know, when you're comparing two things, the one through 10 language kind of lacks. Um, and so I can say I like this wine one through 10 really easily, but the interaction between this cheese and that wine needs more. And so it sounds confusing. And if you ever watch any other program with us, we'll talk a lot about it. It's, we, we bring it up a lot. And so uh, it goes from negative two to positive three. The idea being that um, if it's a negative two, it's like if I brush my teeth, and then drink my orange juice. Everything clashes, negative two. Uh, a negative wine is you've ruined one product. Often you find when you're drinking a red wine and you eat something that reacts weird with the red wine, you take another sip, all of a sudden the wine's gone metallic. That's an example of a negative one. A zero, we mentioned in the beginning, if I'm just on the couch eating and drinking and not doing the swish method, most things are a zero. I think most things don't really interact. Um, a positive one, is if I'm cooking a red sauce and I pour my red wine, the rest of my Chianti bottle in there, my pasta sauce might be really delicious, but I haven't done any favors for the Chianti, just positive one. Positive two is, um, you know, I think really most pairings that would have happened with the goat cheese tonight, um, 
was probably a positive one. The goat cheese is so salty and big that if you use the fonson to kind of soften it, you know, that's more of a positive too. Everything's just kind of, you know, softening off of each other. They're all belt, you know, they're all balancing and working well together. And those positive threes are pretty rare. And that's why people talk so much about them. You know, the port and Stilton and the things like this. And those positive threes are peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. They're the sum of the parts have transcended it. You know, it's better than it ever was. You should only eat these things together. And those are positive threes. And so that's the framework I'm thinking of when I'm putting these things together. I'm, you know, hopefully never having any negative twos or ones. Um, hopefully avoiding zeros and getting you guys positive ones, twos, and depending on your palate, maybe something registers as a three. So um, if anything kind of stood out to you tonight, feel free to throw out the numbers. Um, you know, I really hope you guys enjoyed yourselves. You learned a little bit of something. Um, you know, I just want to kind of echo what I said in the beginning uh, with the gratitude. You know, me and all the other mongers are just so touched by everybody's smiling faces and the support we've been getting. We are very, very lucky to be able to, you know, continue to work the way we do and to serve such wonderful guests as you guys. And so we really want to thank you all from the bottom of our hearts for your support. And uh, we're going to keep feeding you if you guys are still around. So we're going to keep doing what we do. I hope you guys keep uh, watching and keep paying attention and uh, make sure to follow us on all the social media things for the next tastings and recipe ideas. You know, we're really trying to work hard to continue to come up with new content. So um, thank you guys so much. That's mostly all I have to say. Benji or Will, do you guys have anything you want to add? Nope. Looks like we're good on questions. Just thank everyone for, for coming. Will, anything from your end? Um, we're going to leave it open for people to hang out for a little bit. and that, that Yeah, matter. make sure to socialize. Make sure you say hi to the people that you uh, know are on this. Hang out for a little bit. Benji's going to leave it open for, uh, you know, five, ten minutes. So there's no rush. And uh, thank you guys all so much. See you guys soon. Thank you. 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 Thank you.